That last song we sang, I had never heard before, uh, but I like it. It's pretty good. Uh, but thank you for all who participated this evening. Our speaker tonight is Mark Posey. He has served three different congregations in the last 38 years, all of which are in Alabama, and he currently is both a preacher and an elder for the Winfield, Alabama congregation. He has degrees from, from a number of places, uh, Freed Hardeman, David Lipscomb, Heritage Christian, and he has a Doctor of Divinity from the Reformed Theological Seminary. He is the editor for uh, Pulpit Preview, which is a free publication that's sent to over 21,000 different individuals uh, every uh, month. And uh, he is married to Polly, and they have two children and three grandchildren. And I had never uh, met Brother Posey, uh, but he was highly recommended to me when I moved out here. And uh, two years ago, he spoke on our lectureship and just did a, a fantastic job. And so we decided we needed to invite him back uh, this year. And so uh, we're looking forward to what he has to say to us tonight. And please give your attention at this time to Mark Posey as he brings to us a lesson on the witness of the scriptures. John th 20, verses 30 and 31. It is so good to see you this evening, and I hope and pray that you're all doing well. I hope you're proud to be here tonight, that you're at peace, and well, you're living for the Lord. God bless us, and he certainly has. And as we engage in this study tonight, it's my prayer that we will all grow and develop. We will become better, and we'll leave here stronger than when we arrived. God bless you, and thank you for the wonderful Carnes congregation, the outstanding school that is supported by so many. The good work that is being done, and my, what a privilege it is to be a member of the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you this evening, and so good to see you tonight. We're talking about something that is very important, and as we talk about this this evening, I want to stress, well, stress Jesus. Thank God for Jesus, and he has truly blessed us with that. The theme, of course, that you may believe, taken from John chapter 20 and verse number 31. But throughout the Gospel of John, we see the emphasis upon Scripture. So therefore, this evening, we'll be talking about the witness of Scripture. John was very clear in regard to this emphasis. And as it is brought to us, we understand how important it should be to us. And I, I hope after tonight, it's much more important to you than when you arrived. When we think about the scriptures that we find and the scripture in the scriptures, we find that John utilizes this in a number of ways. In fact, he covers this throughout the entirety of the gospel. For example, when we think about what he says in regard to this, we see in John 2 and verse number 22, there he, when he had cleansed the temple and he had talked about uh, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days, they were amazed. And yet, they did not quite understand until after his resurrection what he meant. And then it says, therefore, after he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which he had said, the witness of scripture. We go a little bit further in the gospel there and we find the emphasis in regard to the scripture as well. And we find in chapter 5, and as things are going in regard to the life of Jesus, well, it's at the pool of Bethesda when Jesus heals that man that had been lame and, and so sick for so many years. The folks, they're infuriated. The Jews, they're trying to kill him. They're set out to do that. And he gives them a number of witnesses concerning who he is. He tells them about John the Baptist and the miracles and his father's words and the, and the Holy Spirit and various others. And he comes down to verse number 39 and he tells them about the scriptures that give witness to him. He said, you search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. But he said, these are they which testify of me. The emphasis on scripture. A little bit further when we go to chapter 7 and verse number 38. 
Uh, in that passage, we see that Jesus is now at that last feast, the last day of the great feast. And, and on that feast, there in the dedications, he stands up and in the midst of them and with a loud voice, he begins to say, He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, the witness of scripture. There were those on that day that heard him, and when they heard him, they began to surmise within themselves, is this the prophet? Is he the Messiah? Only the Messiah does not come out of Galilee. And then they say in verse number 42, has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, which David was? There, the witness of scripture it's in chapter 10 when he's there in Jerusalem and it's the Feast of Dedication, uh, the, feast of, uh, the, the, the Feast of Dedication. And, and there the people become so infuriated. They're, they're ready to stone him. They're ready to kill him. And he calls attention to the law and he says there, the scripture cannot be broken. Once again, the witness of scripture. We see him a little bit further in chapter 13 there in the upper room at the Passover feast and the dialogue between he and his disciples is amazing. There he's talking to all of them, but he's not speaking of all of them. And he says there, he says, I do not speak concerning of you, but I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me, he's the one that will lift up his hell against me. Talking about Judas, the witness of scripture. Still even further, when we see him going just a little bit distant from there, we see in chapter 17... That at the finality of that discourse or that pre uh address, he's, he's praying to his father. And the prayer that he prays is amazing. And he says there to his father, he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. He said, those whom you gave to me, I've kept. None of them is lost except the son of perdition. That the scripture might be fulfilled. And there we see the witness of scripture. Still even further, when we come to chapter 19, three times in that chapter, 24, 28, 36, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 37, he makes reference to the prophecy of Zacharias. And there, there once again, or, or, or Zechariah, then, then the scripture is once again emphasized. Chapter 20, he's emphasizing the fact that they, well, they don't know that much or they don't know enough about his resurrection. They don't know enough about the scripture. And he calls attention to all of that. He's talking about scripture. Jesus, John, they continually emphasize the witness of Jesus concerning Scripture. In that passage that Paul made to Timothy, Paul is in Rome in that maritime prison, that deplorable, detestable, that, that dungeon of detriment. And, and he writes to his young son in the faith, uh, young son of the faith, Timothy, in Ephesus. And he reminds him of all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be, what well, is complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. That amazing section of scripture tells us a number of things about that scripture. First of all, it tells us about the inspiration that is the origin of scripture. Where does it come from? It comes from God. It's breathed out. Then we see how important it is in regard to the profit, profitability of Scripture. This word comes to us from the field of economics, and it talks about the dividends that we receive, the usefulness, the benefit, the blessing. Here's the advantageous nature of Scripture, and it comes to us in that fashion. And then we see about the equipping nature of Scripture. That it leaves us with a portfolio that is full and complete. No, no reservation, no hesitation in regard to what Scripture provides. But all encompassing in all of this, we understand this scripture from God that is profitable, that equips us. Well, we understand that it deals with the most important things in all the world because it deals with doctrine and that's what's right. It deals with reproof and that's what is wrong. It deals with correction and that is how to get right. But it also deals with instruction and that is how to stay right. The Apostle Paul is bringing to a crescendo in regard to the scriptures that God has revealed that are profitable in regard to all of us and that equip us with, with everything that we need for life and godliness. And when it comes together and it, it culminates in this intersection of cohesiveness in our lives, we understand that we're headed for something and we're doing something that is greater than all the things in all the world because, you see, we're involved in the greatest work 
and it's God's work. And we're abounding in the work of the Lord. And every work that we're involved in, we understand that it's good. There we understand the blessing and the benefit of Scripture. Scripture is important in regard to the emphasis because we understand that John would say in John 20 and verses 30 and 31, He there said, And many other things truly to Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. The emphasis in regard to the witness of Scripture, very powerful in our lives and very needful. It was the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus that really seems to rise to the top as the cream does. There in chapter 3, He's telling him that Pharisee, that ruler of the Jews that comes to Jesus under the cloak of darkness. And as he comes to Jesus, Jesus says to him, except a man be born again, he'll not see the kingdom of God. We understand that that is a necessity because we must be born again. That is born from above. Anathane is the word. It is not a physical, a temporary, a, 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 a birth of this life, but rather it is a birth from the, from the, very, divine, the very divine presence of God. If there was any confusion in Nicodemus, and truly that was the case, then we see Jesus clarifying in verse number 5 that what it means to be born again means that you must be born of water and the Spirit to see and to enter the kingdom of God. Verse number 10, Nicodemus, he is told by Jesus, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things. In verse number 12, he said, if I tell you earthly things and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things and expect, expect you to believe? And then we have that great illustration from the Old Testament, Numbers 21. And in verse number 14 there, Jesus tells him in a very powerful way. He said, and as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I love that verse and I, I especially love that adverb. That we find as, and as Moses lifted up the servant of the wilderness. There Moses, he erected that remedy for those snake-bitten people. And Jesus says, just as that occurred, then I must be lifted up for the sin-laden humanity. Jesus told of the prescription for sin. The worst thing in all the world. I began to think and I... I began to wonder concerning all of this and see just how important Jesus was in revealing all of these things. I believe what John is taking us and the journey that he is revealing is that journey from the cross to the crown. And he's telling us that that journey is paved with the way of Scripture. I think about what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 2 and verse number 9. He said, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. He was... There for the suffering of death and crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. There John and the Hebrew writer are telling us about the sacrifice, the sovereignty, and the suffering of Jesus. As Brother Franklin Camp used to say, he said, brethren, he said the, the Bible surrounds one verse and can be explained with one scripture. He said it's Luke 1 in verse number 68. He said there we find the centrality, the nucleus, the very center of all that God intends for us to know. There are the words of Zacharias, the, the father of John the Baptist. But John, Zacharias is not talking about his son. He's talking about Jesus. And there, blessed is the God, the Lord God of Israel. He has visited and redeemed his people. The more I study the Bible, the more I'm convinced that there is a thread, a common denominator that runs through the entirety of God's word from Genesis to Revelation. And that theme in one word for the Bible is this. Brethren, the Bible is about Jesus. John, make sure that we emphasize and understand the importance of Scripture in relationship to that. I invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to John the 19th chapter and let's read a few Scriptures and then make, I believe, an application that will be helpful for all of us in understanding what's going on as we see the greatest event 
in the history of time and its application for all of us tonight. John 19, beginning in verse number 23. Let's read this together. You got your Bible? Look in your Bible and let's read this. Beginning in verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one place. They also therefore among themselves, they said among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, for the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood to the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and his disciple whom he loved, he standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and there, there filled a sponge with sour wine and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and, and that they might be taken away. Then the... Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side. He pierced it with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Of all the things that have ever occurred on the face of this earth and the time that we know when Jesus died on the cross on that cruel Calvary Everything that had ever happened looked forward to that moment. And since then, we have been looking back. My brothers and sisters and friends, I read that text and there is one thing that comes to my mind and my heart. And that is, thank God for Jesus. When we think about these things, there's a lot of threes that go on in this world. Have you ever thought about how many times the word three is used? Three strikes and you're out. A three ring circus. Those three little pigs and three musketeers. Mo, Larry, and Curly were the three stooges. And doesn't Will look handsome in his three-piece suit? <laughs> Amen to that. Those three little kittens and those three blind mice and even Lionel Richie sang about three times a lady. The last time I was in a three-legged race, I lost. And how many times have things been decided by rock, paper, and scissors? Even in the world of Harry Potter, you have Harry, Hermione, and Ron, those three. And just a couple of hours ago at Cracker Barrel, I enjoyed a B-L-T. 
There's a lot of threes in this world. And in fact, when you think about the threes, there's a lot of threes surrounding the cross. Three denials by Peter, three crosses. One died in sin, one died to sin, one died for sin. Those three Marys and the three hours of darkness, the three words, the three last words, it is finished to tell us die. The three days and night in the tomb and even the three parts of the, the wonderful message of God that culminate and intersect in regard to what Paul calls in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the gospel. And it's the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And oftentimes people think that there were three soldiers that were primarily instrumental in crucifying Jesus as we have just read, but really they weren't. There were four soldiers that were involved. And when we think about those four soldiers, I want to call it to your attention. We just got through reading that when the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part. When we look at John's account of the witness of Scripture, we see that in John 19, there were four soldiers that walked away from the cross. The most significant and important event in the history of time. And each one of those soldiers was affected differently and carried with him something, a takeaway from the cross. I want you to, to think about that with me this evening. When we think about the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the first soldier we see, he took a souvenir. See, we read there in verse number 24, it says, They said therefore among themselves, Let us not, let us not tear it, but, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, now they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. There we're talking about not the garments that they had divided asunder among the soldiers, but now we're talking about that tunic that was woven from top to bottom without seam. And, and this first soldier, he, he took with him when he, led, when he left the cross that day. He took a souvenir. Little did he know that he was fulfilling scripture as he walked away from the cross that day with that prized possession. This soldier, obviously, he was unconcerned about Jesus. He, he was just there seeing what he could get, an interested observer. He, he wanted a souvenir, a token, something that he could take with him, might even sell it or even brag about it later. He just wanted some Calvary or Golgotha memorabilia. I wonder from time to time, and I pray that there are not those in the church just like that. That they see that the, the Lord and the crucifixion and the church and those things that are involved in Christianity, they're better than and they're greater than, than a souvenir. James had something to say in James 1 in verse number 17 and following. Listen to what he said there. He said, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begot he us. For the word of truth that we should become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and all the residue of immorality and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Now watch it. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Folks, it's got to be more in the life of a Christian than a hearer. We must put what we hear into action. He said, For if any man is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. We understand that to be a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he says he, he saw. I'm going to ask you a simple question. And 
I imagine many of you will know the answer to this. Folks, why do we look in a mirror? Oh, preacher, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> we look into the mirror, and I, I was looking in the mirror when I left the hotel room, and I said, man, I'm having a good hair day. <laughs> I thought, well, thank God I've still got my hair. <laughs> But James is talking about not looking into a physical mirror. He's talking about looking into the mirror of the Word of God. And let me ask you again. Why do we look into the Word of God? To see what we look like. And folks, Scripture tells us that it's more than just, than just seeing Jesus on the cross and then finding something of, of, uh, of just a token or, or, or something that is just a... Uh, a souvenir. It's got to be that we hear the word and then we do the word. Four soldiers walked away from the cross that, that, that day on Calvary. And one of them he took a souvenir. An innocent bystander just looking on to see what he could get out of it. The second soldier, he, he walked away from the cross. And, and, and when we look in the text and we see there in verse number 29, now there was a vessel of sour wine that was sitting there and they, they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Jesus had just said... I thirst. You know, the pronoun they seems to indicate that all of them were involved in fetching the sponge, filling it with sour wine, and lifting it to Jesus' mouth. But really, when we go to Matthew's account, there Matthew says that immediately one ran and found a sponge and filled it with sour wine, put it upon hyssop and raised it to the mouth of Jesus. There were two times that Jesus had been offered something to drink. In Mark chapter 15, when he arrived at Golgotha, the text says he was offered sour wine mixed with myrrh, sometimes called gall. Could it have been that that was a sedative of some nature to help the pain to be diminished by the one being crucified and Jesus refused? And now in John 19, he is offered while hanging on the cross something that would, well, that would address his parched lips. He said, I thirst and, and that one runs immediately. And... Uh, Now, I don't imagine this is quite what a sponge looked like in the first century. This is actually a Walmart special. I think the Walmart in Jerusalem came on a few years later, wasn't it? Let your mind wrap around it. I'm particularly interested there in that little statement concerning hyssop. Found throughout the Palestinian valley in the mint family. Used in a number of ways. And one of the ways it was used was in a spiritual context. Go back to the first Passover and there they've sacrificed the lamb. And they've collected the blood in a basin. And now it's time to take and strike the, strike the blood on the lintel and the doorpost. So that when death comes over it will bypass or pass over that house. And... And there they're told to take hyssop and dip into the basin and put it on the lintel and the doorpost. Come a little bit further in the Bible in there in Hebrews, according to what the Hebrew writer said, Moses, in the construction of the tabernacle and even the dedication of the tabernacle, cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop was to be utilized in this most wonderful occasion. And then whether it was cleansing of leprosy and or it was offering of a red heifer there in Leviticus and Numbers. Then 
You see once again that hyssop was utilized in regard to this carrying out of this most momentous type thing. Even David, when he was lamenting in the penitential psalm of Psalm 51 and melodiously singing in regard to the guilt that was weighing down heavy upon his soul about the sins that he committed in 2 Samuel 11 and 12, he cries out, purge me with hyssop that I might be clean. And now we have Jesus on the cross. Do I feel the, the sun beating? Do I know about the sweat dripping? The heart is pounding and the, the lungs are burning and the eyes are dimming and the lips are cracking. I didn't have any hyssop available to me. That's a yellow pine limb from my backyard. But once again, let your mind wrap around it. And the sponge is taken and put on hyssop. I've got a jar here of vinegar. When wine sours, it turns to vinegar. I'm not going to open it because it might knock me out. But I can't to begin to imagine soaking that sponge to the dripping point and then lifting that to the lips of the Son of God. Four soldiers walked away from the cross that day. One took a souvenir. One took a sponge. And yet James tells us that this sponge, as it were in application, it's got to be more than that. In James 1, beginning in verse number 1, notice what he said. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now don't miss it. James says, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, let me tell you this, this evening and, and listen to me well. We need more servants in the Lord's church. James says it's got to be more than just, than just feeling sorry for Jesus, tender-hearted, that you run and get something to alleviate a situation, but it really doesn't change your life whatsoever. And James goes on to say in chapter, chapter 1 and verse number 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Do you know what James is saying? He's saying it's more than just feeling sorry for Jesus. It is serving the Savior. He says in verse 9, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, for as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat that it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So shall the rich man fade away in his ways. And then he says that first beatitude in the glorious epistle of the brother of our Lord. He said, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised him that love him. Folks, four soldiers walked away from the cross that day. One carried a souvenir. He got a little something out of it. One felt sorry for Jesus. Very emotional and tender hearted, but it didn't change. It didn't change his life. 
But there was a third soldier that walked away from the cross that day, and this soldier, he took a spear. When we come down in the text in verse number 33, and there it says, But when, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they, they did not break his leg. They didn't, they didn't break the legs of Jesus, but, but one of them, one of the soldiers pierced his side. He pierced his side with a spear. And immediately, blood and water came out. What a hateful act. What a rebellious act. What an act of anger. Why defile the body of Jesus? He's already dead. Now, of course, little did he know that he was fulfilling Scripture. Zechariah 12 and verse 10. Then they will look upon me whom they pierced. So significant is this event that it was not only... Not only recorded by inspiration, but it'll also be remembered at judgment. Revelation 1 and verse 7. Behold, he cometh in, in clouds, and every eye shall see him, even they who pierced him. We don't know a lot about what took place. Whether it was his right side or his left side, but you can about imagine... As that spear went into the side of Jesus. Many say it probably perforated his diaphragm, went into his lung, and, and pierced his heart. Whatever happened, it was terrible. And here's a mean-spirited man that is set on doing harm. And folks, we must learn from that. And, and I believe that we do because James, he would say in chapter 1 and verse 13 and following, listen to what he says. He said, let no man say. Let no man say what, James? James. Let no man say when he is tempted, let him not, do not ever say this. James says, I am tempted of God. He said, because God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted to any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. That pronoun there, O-W-N, is very powerful. His own lust, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. 16 says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Four soldiers walked away from the cross that day. One was just interested what he could get out of it. He took a souvenir. Another one felt sorry, emotional. Hurtful, tender-hearted, but, but it really didn't change him in any way. Another soldier, he, he took a spear with him that day, thrusting it inside to the side of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This rebellious, hateful, harmful. But there is a fourth soldier... And the fourth soldier that walked away from the cross that day, he took a savior. In Mark's record, in Mark 13, 15 and verse 39, there the text reads thusly. So when the centurion who stood facing him saw what? Saw that he cried and that he 
and that he, he breathed his last. He said, truly, this is the Son of God. This soldier, when he walked away from the cross that day, he took a Savior. This soldier that was so instrumental in regard to the events that took place, making that good confession like the eunuch did, in Acts the 8th chapter, What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip told him, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If we confess him here on this earth, he'll confess us before our Father which is in heaven. But folks, listen to me and listen to me well. If we are ashamed or do not confess him here on this earth, he will not confess us before his Father in heaven. What a great confession. That soldier made on that day. Oh, how important it is. James would say this beginning in verse number 25. Oh, listen to this. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. If any man among you seemeth to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man shall, well, he shall experience and his religion will be called vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself or yourself unspotted from the world. Four soldiers walked away from the cross that day. Yes, one of them... Well, you see, he was, he was one that he took a token. He had some memorabilia. Just something to remember Jesus and the event by. Another soldier, he took a sponge. Very tender-hearted and emotional. But, but there was no commitment there. There was a soldier that walked away from the cross carrying that spear that had thrust into the side of Jesus and out came water and blood. He was the one in a rebellious, a hateful way. He thrust it into the very Son of God and he expressed his attitude in doing that way. But then there's that, that soldier that looked at the things that took place and listened to the words that Jesus said and saw the events as it were. And when he, when he concluded... Without a doubt, he's God's son. Now this evening, here's the proposition. If I were to ask every one of you to get up and one by one file across this stage and ask you, in which chair would you sit? In which one would you associate with? I'm sure that everyone would come down here and say, I want to be a part of the Savior. I want to, I want to make sure that my life is, is all that God wants me to be. And I'm not going to ask you to get up here and come and choose a chair. I'm simply going to ask you in your heart to do some self-examination. And to take into consideration how you're living right here and right now. Folks, this evening, we have seen the witness of Scripture concerning the greatest event that has ever taken place in the history of time. And I want you to consider the words of Jesus as we bring this to a close. In Luke 9, in verse number 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. If we can help you in this way in becoming obedient unto Jesus this evening... 
through a living faith, repent of your sins, confess that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, to submit to baptism in water by immersion for the remission of your sins, so that then and only then you can be resurrected into everything, all things, into absolutely everything that is new. Yet if you have fallen short of the glory of God, that you'll come back to God through Jesus Christ this evening. If we can help you in any way. Don't leave here tonight. And take away from the cross anything but the Savior. Come as together we stand and as we sing.